morning on Nightwatch, analyzing Louisiana's new anti-abortion law. It's specifically designed to, uh, to fly in the face of Roe v. Wade and, and get the, uh, the escalator, uh, the rapid escalator up to the Supreme Court. Duck poachers who reformed. I never really hunted. I never, I killed. I never hunted. And hunting right now, all of these years that I did all of this killing, I really never enjoyed the sport of hunting, the fair chase thing. The enduring legacy of boxer Joe Lewis. Though he had the failings that they could all identify with, he still strove to be better. He did not uh, lower his standards for what uh, he wanted to do. Also, how much America spends on illegal drugs, the perils of traveling together if you're gay, and the man who conducts the symphony in Fairbanks, Alaska. Now in Washington, here is CBS News correspondent Betsy Aaron. Good morning. With the override of Governor Buddy Romer's veto, Louisiana has enacted the strictest anti-abortion law in the nation. But it is not the first. After the Supreme Court expanded the rights of states to restrict abortion, the states of Pennsylvania and Utah and the territory of Guam have all passed laws that limit a woman's right to have an abortion. These laws have been challenged in court, and a similar challenge to the Louisiana law is expected. This morning we're going to try to avoid the pros and cons of abortion. Instead, we want to focus on the new law, both as a legal and as a political issue, and examine the impact that it will have in Louisiana and nationwide. Joining us are Mark Hager, professor of constitutional law at American University here in Washington, and from New Orleans, Susan Howell, professor of political science and director of survey research at the University of New Orleans. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Howell, you've got to explain to us what's going on down in Louisiana. You've got a governor who's uh, vetoed an abortion bill three times. Uh, it's pretty clear where he stands. Why do they keep coming back at him? Well, I think um, the, the recent override is the critical event. He, the legislature overrode the veto yesterday. Um, I think that the override really sets the stage for the governor's race. Um, it allows Romer now to run against the legislature. He can portray himself as the reformer, the person who's attempted to, to modernize Louisiana, to clean up the environment, to give the teachers pay raises and tie it to evaluations. And the legislature has really blocked him at every point. So he can portray himself as the reformer and the legislature as obstructionist. Now, on the other hand, I think his opponents can point to the override as probably the ultimate example of Romer's ineffectiveness. And they can possibly say it doesn't matter how many good ideas you have, if you can't get them passed and you can't implement them, you know, what good is it? So I think that those are the two themes that we will see quite a bit in the governor's race. Well, tell, now, tell us where the citizens in Louisiana stand on this issue because everyone is always taking for abortion and nationally it seems mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a majority that favors pro-choice. Well, in Louisiana, it's a little bit more evenly split. Louisiana is more conservative than the nation on the issue of abortion. But the, the two ends, the pro-life end and the pro-choice end are probably equal, whereas nationwide the pro-choice end would be larger. Uh, now, but there's a difference in the intensity. I mean, pro-life people in Louisiana and nationwide are much more um, likely to vote on the basis of the abortion issue, whereas a pro-choice person will vote on the basis of something else. And I think this is one of the reasons the legislature is responsive to the pro-life pressure. They are very intense, they're very mobilized, they're very organized. Professor Hager, it almost looks as if uh, while the action is in the states, everyone in the states who is pro-choice, is, who is pro-life, is looking directly at the Supreme Court saying, take my bill, take my bill, I want to be the one to kill Roe versus Wade, or at least, if not to kill it, to, uh, to take the teeth out of it. Is this Louisiana bill the bill that is most likely, you think, to get to the Supreme Court? It's certainly very likely. It's specifically designed to uh, to reach the Supreme Court on uh, on an attempt to overturn the 
the uh, Roe v. Wade uh, decision of 1973. Explain uh, that for us. Uh, how is it designed to do that? Well, it's, it, uh, it has provisions in it which specifically contradict, uh, specifically go beyond the restrictions on abortion that Roe v. Wade indicates are permissible uh, for the states. Uh, for example, it, uh, it allows abortions only in the uh, case of a threat to uh, the mother's, uh, uh, to save the mother's life, or in cases of, of rape and incest. Uh, Roe v. Wade indicates that uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the first trimester, the state may not, uh, may, may not regulate abortion for, uh, for any reason. Uh, so it's specifically designed to, uh, to fly in the face of Roe v. Wade and, and get the, uh, the escalator, uh, the rapid escalator up to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Hager, I mean, what does he see as a timeline here? I mean, how long can we expect to wait for a possible decision from the Supreme Court? Because that's probably how long these things are not going to be enforced. Yes, the, uh, it, it would not obviously be, uh, be addressed by the Supreme Court uh, this, uh, this summer uh, for mm -hmm. the uh, October term uh, decisions. About the earliest would be, uh, would be sometime in, in 1992. The, uh, the case will be uh, heard by the federal judge in Louisiana uh, sometime in July, and then, there, uh, then it will be appealed uh, to the federal appeals court, and from there the appeal is... Uh, is to the Supreme Court and each of those processes uh, uh, of, uh, of arguments and uh, the issuance of an opinion uh, can be expected to take uh, a number of months. Can you guess for us, looking at what the Supreme Court has been doing and chipping away at Roe versus Wade, uh, what direction it would lean in, in regarding this bill? Uh, I can guess a little bit. Right now you have four justices on the court, Justices Kennedy, White, uh, Rehnquist, and Scalia who back in 1989 with the Webster decision indicated fairly explicitly that they were prepared to overrule uh, Roe v. Wade, which would take away the uh, abortion rights and kick the entire issue back to the states. Um, Justice O'Connor, who has been one of the chippers chipping away at uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, in my view, uh, will not vote to explicitly, uh, explicitly to overrule, uh, overrule Roe v. Wade. Uh, she will continue to be a chipper, I think, without a without a total overthrow. I think she does not want to go down in in uh, in the history books as the woman justice who overturned uh, Roe v. Wade. So the real key figure and big question mark is the new justice, Justice Souter, uh, who played very coy in his uh, in his appointment uh, hearings, uh, made indications that could. Uh, could give hope to both sides in the debate without committing himself uh, in any way. It was very interesting, some of the things he had to say uh, during the uh, debate, but uh, very equivocal. So he is the big question mark. We're going to have to take a break, but we want to talk about this whole chipping away process. And uh, you wake up one morning and uh, there's been so much chipping that uh, you can't really recognize what you're left with. And what you're left with may fly in the face of what you started out with. Uh, yes, it's been we very want to talk about uh, Louisiana politics. That's always fun. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. The subject is abortion. Not are you for or against abortion or for pro-choice or for pro-life. We're looking at the legal aspects of what's just happened in Louisiana. Uh, the Louisiana legislature says that they are going to put this bill on hold until the federal court in Louisiana acts. Now, if the federal court upholds this law restricting abortion, uh, then it will go into effect. What happens? That's, that's my understanding, that they're, uh, they don't want to be uh, enforcing uh, a law uh, against uh, people in the meantime that is due to be struck down as unconstitutional by a federal court within the space of, of two months. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a waste and a bother. However, if the uh, federal court in, that sits in Louisiana does uh, uphold the law, my understanding is that at that point uh, the law would, uh, would uh, become uh, legally binding and enforceable, although meanwhile, of course, it will be appealed up uh, to the federal appellate court and thence, uh, I expect, to the Supreme Court. How would you describe this legislature? Are, are they full of mavericks, or is this a, a very well-considered position by uh, serious politicians? Well, I think some of them are certainly voting their conscience and truly take a pro-life position. 
I think others are probably responding to pressures from pro-life groups. Um, I think that this legislature over the last two years has done some things that could be perceived as strange. I mean, they did get hung up on flag burning last year and they've passed three very stringent anti-abortion bills. I think part of uh, what this is going to mean in Louisiana is that the governor um, is going to be somewhat blamed for this in that he, the governor is very strong in Louisiana and he really hasn't been able to control the legislature. And I think in the absence of strong gubernatorial leadership, this allows individual legislators to kind of pursue their own agendas. And um, I think that the general perceived craziness in the legislature will probably um, hurt Romer a little bit in the sense that he, he wasn't able to do anything about it. On the other hand, he will say that he, he'll take the high road and say he attempted to um, uh, reform Louisiana and take a moderate stand and the, the legislature was determined to be extreme. Is he going to get away with that? Well, I think it depends on how it plays with uh, the professional white class of voters. These are the base of his support. And if they are want to continue to follow kind of the lone wolf candidate, then it will help him. But if on the other hand, they um, are, are seeing him as increasingly isolated and unable to deal with the legislature, then it's going to hurt him. You know, it's interesting. The CBS New York Times poll that was taken in June of 1991 asked a question, uh, which of these comes closest to your view? Abortion should be generally available to those who want it. Abortion should be available but under stricter limits than it is now. Or abortion should not be permitted. Uh, generally available got 37%. Available but stricter limits, the chip away theory, got 38%. Uh, not permitted 22. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if these poll, if this poll is accurate, then what the Supreme Court is doing is reflective of of the public, and what the state legislatures are doing is reflective. It's very difficult to tell what the American public really thinks about the abortion issue because the American public doesn't really know what it thinks about uh, the abortion issue. A lot depends in these polls how you uh, how you ask the question. If you ask a question that says something like do you believe that women should have uh, the right to you to uh, get an abortion for any reason under any circumstances even as a method of, of birth control uh, lots of the public will say no if uh, you say should uh, should they, should a woman have a right to get an abortion in the case of rape incest or or threat to the mother's uh, health virtually uh, a large proportion of the population will say yes these questions in the CBS poll are vaguer even than uh, than those questions so it's it's really hard to uh, to feel the pulse. A lot of people are very confused about abortion, don't know exactly what they think about how available it should be. There's also the discomfort level to deal with. Uh, there are predictions that abortion is going to be a very, very hot issue in the 92 presidential race. Uh, but politicians don't really like to deal with this, do they, Professor? No, they don't. And I think just about anything you say on abortion, you offend someone. And so politicians would just as soon avoid the issue altogether, but they're going to be forced to deal with it, particularly with these court cases being decided. Um, I think in Louisiana, in the governor's race, we have a case where we have one uh, pro-choice person, the incumbent governor, and then six or seven pro-life candidates. And so, you know, it, it really is kind of well-defined for Louisiana. But I think in, in elections in general, this is something politicians would just as soon leave alone. It's interesting, too, because if, if Roe v. Wade is overturned uh, and it's kicked back to the state legislatures, there will be a shift in momentum. Uh, with Roe v. Wade in place, the, uh, the passionate energy has, has mostly been on the pro-life side. Politicians could get votes from very angry voters who were on the losing side and wanted to, wanted to get back on the winning side. George Bush has gotten emotional mileage out of, uh, out of opposing abortion, at least at the uh, rhetorical level. If abortion is again restricted, uh, then the, uh, the angry energy will switch over to the pro-life side, and uh, the, uh, the uh, steam on the, on the pro-life side will, will be lost a little bit, and politicians will be able to, to uh, uh, get uh, energy from voters by uh, standing up for uh, the abortion right for women. Yes. Thank you very much to both of you for coming in. Uh, we'll be watching this and talk to you again. Thank you. Thank Stay you. with us for more of Night Watch.
under the best of circumstances can be difficult as well as challenging. But those of us who are addicted to it do it anyway. Why not? It's usually fun, or at least the stories are fun to tell after the fact if you live through it all. But consider this. If you are gay or lesbian, does travel take on another dimension? Is planning ahead even more important? Do you have to worry about the no room at the inn syndrome once the innkeeper takes a look at you? A new guidebook could smooth the road. It's called Are You Two Together? A Gay and Lesbian Travel Guide to Europe. Writers Lindsay Van Gelder and Pamela Brandt have been a couple since 1978. We're really glad you could come in and talk about this book. Hi. I love the fact that in the introduction to the book, you said you wrote it because it was a book you wanted to read. <laughs> was this really uh, something very serious? Is this a subject that really needed to be tackled, even though you tackle it with a great sense of humor? Oh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, we interviewed a number of people in the book who had had horrible problems traveling. Uh, a gay male couple who were told by a flight attendant on a plane not to hold hands anymore. That basically ruined the beginning of their vacation. Um, a lesbian couple who had the keys ripped out of their hands at an inn in uh, Nice, France. So when those kinds of things happen, um, you sort of wish that you had known where to go in the first place. And we hope that this book will tell people where they will be welcome and where they can really have a good time, which is what you're supposed to do on your vacation. Do you two have any horror stories about your traveling? Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> tell us the goriest. Why don't you tell them about uh, Nice? No, no, in, in, in Osh. Remember that, those people yeah. in Osh? Well, we are major flaunters, and we were long before we wrote this book. Uh, in fact, when we were writing the book, it was kind of fun to go in and be very openly gay because we knew that the worst thing that could happen if somebody was awful to us, we would have wonderful material for the book. Um, but on a previous trip, when we were not doing research, we went to um, a small hotel in a small town in southwestern France. And the uh, person at the desk, when we asked for a double bed, and my French is, is, is fine, um, chose to misunderstand and to uh, finally try to put us in two separate rooms, each with a double bed. We finally got that straightened out and we thought, well, could this have been a language problem? Then we heard them talking about us later on. Um, this was one of the kind of small hotels where you have to pay to take a shower. And they were having a lot of problems with their plumbing. Um, so uh, when we left, we took our little Swiss Army knives, which many lesbians carry, and turned on the shower and left it on. And we hope we gave them no hot water for the rest of the day. And so. this happens in France. This story is Liberal, in your book. Liberal, wonderful, romantic France. France is supposed to be the land of love and understanding and, and liberalism. This was, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And this was a hotel that we had found out uh, about from... Mm -hmm. It was a student travel guide, a rather hip student mm -hmm. travel guide. So you would think that, mm -hmm. that this hotel would have been used to all kinds of people. You just never weren't. know, though. I mean, we had many places that would have looked conservative to us where people were delighted to have gay guests. So it's, uh, you never know. And until you wrote this book, was mm -hmm. there anything, was there any guide, was there any hotline telephone number that anyone could call to say, can I go to France? Where should I go? Where should I stay out of? There are other gay guides. Mm -hmm. there, there, there have been a number of gay guides out for, for years. The problem is that mostly they're name and address lists. Um, they're not descriptive at all, and a lot of them are, are not very well researched. A lot of them just rely on sort of volunteer information that, that comes in from people. And a lot of them are out of date. Things in the gay world go in and out of business very, very quickly. Um, what, what was the, the criterion for this book? What did you look for? Places where gay people would feel comfortable, whether it was a hotel or a restaurant or a nightclub? Well, we're real history buffs. And one of the reasons I think anybody travels is to get a sense of history. I mean, certainly many Americans have European roots, uh, you know, our culture, or we ourselves. Um, there's quite a lot of gay history in Europe. So one of the things we did was to go around to places that had very rich gay history. Christopher Isherwood's Berlin, Gertrude Stein's Paris, uh, you know, the king that they call Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria, except he was really gay King Ludwig, the guy who the Disneyland castles were based on his castles. A number of other places like that we followed in those footsteps. Are you offended by those who might say, if you didn't flaunt mm -hmm. your situation, then you'd have an easier time of it? Yes. <laughs> 
basically, uh, we don't do any, we hold hands at dinner, we hold hands on the street. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this before, what we do um, is flaunting that when straight people do it, it's just considered normal real life. Let's talk about Europe, usually the first place that, uh, that Americans go when they leave the United States for mm -hmm. that first big trip. Uh, mm -hmm. Any big surprises on uh, the obvious tourist places in Europe, uh, those that are most friendly mm -hmm. to homosexual couples and those to watch out for? Well, there were, there's a way in which, as a gay traveler, you can plug into things that uh, a straight traveler can't because your culture is there. Um, there, in every large city in Europe and in many of the small cities, there is a gay community. And in general, the laws over there are far more liberal than here. So one of the nice surprises is that you, when you know where to go, you feel very much at home. But it's hard to mm -hmm. find out where to go unless yeah. you buy this book. <laughs> Amsterdam is a wonderful place for, mm -hmm. for gay travelers. Of course, it's a wonderful place for anybody. Mm -hmm. But they're, basically what they've done in Amsterdam is they've agreed to disagree. Everybody in Amsterdam has horrendously different opinions but they all they believe that they should be tolerant of each other's opinions and so for example we visited a male brothel in Amsterdam because trying to be our book is very much a book for gay men and gay women both mm -hmm. and so we were trying to be fair and be good researchers and uh, we I've heard that line before <laughs> all, all for research <laughs> Well, it was, it was a very nice place. It was nicer yeah. than a lot of hotels we've stayed, I'll tell you. It was beautiful inside. Mm -hmm. And it, really, if gay men want to uh, ever ever try a place like this, Amsterdam would be the place to do it because they are, they're very careful about safe mm -hmm. sex. It's, uh, you know, there's mm -hmm. no question about it. Unlike some places, Spain, I, I, we would never advise uh, mm -hmm. men to try something mm -hmm. like that. But anyway, so there we were in this, in this brothel in Amsterdam, and a fellow came, came in after his strip show looked about 22 years old. He turned out to be 45 years old, and by day, his day job was he was an investment banker at one of the most prominent uh, Amsterdam banks. But his day job just was not entirely fulfilling to him, so at night he worked as a hustler. And when we asked him if the people at the bank were at all chagrined by this, he just looked at us like we were crazy, because it's Amsterdam. Yeah. This is what happened. What a place to take culture. a break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back, we'll talk about uh, other boring stories about gay travel. <laughs> Stay with us for more Night Watch. Ahead on Nightwatch, more about how the travel industry treats gays. The prize fight of the century, half a century later. A drug habit with a $40 billion price tag. The classical music of the Yukon. And poachers who've turned into preachers. Now here is CBS News correspondent Betsy Aaron. Welcome back. Uh, the subject is gay and lesbian travel. The book is called Are You Two Together? You had a good time writing this book, didn't you? Was it work? It was a lot of work, and our friends are, don't feel at all sorry for us when we tell them that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we go and say, oh, we just couldn't stand to go to one more perfectly beautiful bar and have another perfectly wonderful European beer, and they say, oh, that's <laughs> terrible. Tell us about the non-mainstream places that you discovered in the research for the book that you want people to know about, places that you wouldn't think of off the top of your head to go where you really have a good time. Well, there's Wales, for example, which is hardly a gay hotspot, but um, we, we went there because there's a town in Wales, Langochlan, which is the home of the ladies of Langochlan, who were two women who ran away with each other at the end of the 17th century, lived together in this town for 50 years, became respected citizens. People like Sir Walter Scott and even British royalty would come and visit them and pay, pay homage. Uh, there's, a, there's a plaque to them in the town church. They're in full drag, top hats. 
ties everything together. Um, and in Wales also, for example, we found a lesbian shoe factory. The, these shoes, can you... Made by lesbian elves. Okay. Lesbian elves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Terrific. We really like cities in Europe, but in general, we really like the small places. And we tell gay people in our book, don't assume that, you know, this is going to be redneck territory. You know, Europe, in Europe, you are not likely to get bashed. And go to these sort of wonderful small towns where there's a lot of history and where Europe looks like it used to. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also another message in this mm. book that's quite interesting to the straight community. Mm. It's that you are a big industry, mm. that you have a lot of money to spend. And if the travel industry wakes up, uh, they can make a lot of money from this uh, community. Well, I think gay travelers, they, they've done surveys, and I think gay people are seven times more likely to have frequent flyer cards, for example. Mm. Uh, we also tend to be dual income uh, Households. Fewer have people have kids. What about the question of the downside, if it is a downside? Because certainly in this country it happens that all of a sudden a place is either comfortable for gay people or not comfortable for gay people, and it becomes a gay place. Instead of becoming a place for everybody, would hotel owners or would restaurant owners be concerned about the fact that if a restaurant is written up in this book, a hotel is written up in this mm. book, uh, straight people will stay away. That happens less in Europe. Uh, for instance, there we have a chapter on a town outside Barcelona called Sitges, which has been uh, a gay popular resort for um, generations at this point, since the turn of the century. It's mm -hmm. sort of like the province town of Spain. It was an artist's turn of the century. A great deal of straight tourism there and a great deal of support for people. It's nice to hear, but you mm. think of the Latin settlement and you think that this do, is not a, a place that, uh, that mm. people would feel comfortable. Mm. What mm -hmm. other stereotypes do you bring in this book? Mm. Well, I think, oddly enough, some being gay works work for you, uh, in conjunction with what you were saying. Um, if, you, if, if, you were, if two women were in the closet and pretending to be straight, two straight men, hoteliers might very likely not want to give them a room because there is a stereotype that what straight men are going to do is be sobs, um, spill beer and, and so forth all over the rug and the bedspreads, tear things up, have wild parties. And hoteliers all over the place, when we would go and check with them, are gay people welcome here? They would say, oh, gay men, they're such gentlemen, so clean, so nice. <laughs> it's like renting an apartment from a gay person who has decorated <laughs> yes. so beautifully. Yes. <laughs> so, you don't think that's crazy. Well, this is all fun and games, but were there any doubts mm -hmm. that these ones that didn't face with the difference? Yes. We did something called the drill. Um, we thought it was very important to be able to tell readers that they were welcome to the places that we list, which meant that we had to go around to a lot of places and present ourselves. Sometimes we imagined we were the first openly gay person that whoever we were talking to had met, and sometimes they did say But we had many more people 